Okay, so this is going to be a lecture on phenomenology, which is a particular discipline or school within philosophy. And what I'm trying to do is give some basics about it in such a way that I think might actually contribute to a deeper and a richer understanding of art. So what I'm aiming to do here is to explain and articulate some of the basic principles and ideas of phenomenology in such a way that they can kind of guide a richer comprehension of what it means to have conscious experience of something and how based on that conscious experience we can represent or make an image of what has been given in that conscious experience in the first place. In other words, as we get into a more detailed, more robust, more fleshed out presentation of what our conscious experience is actually like, that's probably going to lead to a richer, more fleshed out, more robust understanding of how we can make images of or representations of what has been given in our conscious experience. Because in, in a way, I think in a very meaningful way, the visual arts are a means of making present again, something that has been given an experience. So a, a landscape artist, for example, will have viewed and been very moved by particular landscapes. And then based on his memory of those landscapes, based on the photographs he took of those landscapes, et cetera, he will, he will by means of his painting, represent, represent that original experience of that landscape in a new medium, right? So when I'm looking at, for example, uh, a Frederick Church painting or a Cobbleston painting, in a way, I'm being drawn toward that original experience of nature that generated the motivation for those artists to make those paintings. Now, what this means is that if we get a clear understanding of what it looks like for us to have conscious experience and some of the details about that conscious experience and some of the depth that can be had through conscious experience, we get a foothold, if you will, onto the best ways perhaps to reimagine and repre represent that conscious experience through the use of visual arts. So the aim here is, is in a sense twofold. Like I said, the first is an articulation of this branch of philosophy called phenomenology to see what kind of insights it has, what are its main guiding principles. But the second <coughs> idea is to use those insights, those, those basic principles, those, those notions of phenomenology to see what can this tell us about our conscious experience in terms of rendering visual art based on that consciousness. In what ways can my understanding of my conscious experience contribute to a clearer sense of that experience itself and how to represent that experience by means of a painting, a sculpture, et cetera. So it's not just an academic exercise per se, it's an exercise in sort of an academic field insofar as it contributes to a clear understanding of that conscious experience that we have that serves as a foundation for visual arts. You know, if you, if you want to get a, this is a, an analogy I'll borrow from a philosopher named Rene Descartes, who said, look, if you're going to make any sort of building, you have to ensure the solidity of the foundation. You have to ensure that the foundation is very solid, it's concrete, it's not going to move. Otherwise, everything else built upon it will crumble. And I think in an, anal in an analogous way, something similar holds up in terms of, of art. 
if we don't have a clear sense of what our conscious experience is like and how it occurs and the ways in which it occurs and the depth that it can and have, then it's going to be very difficult to have a good and healthy way of representing that conscious experience in art. If I don't know what my conscious experience is really like, how can I properly image it by means of a painting or a sculpture? If I'm not really sure about the way something has been given in my conscious experience, how can I properly represent it through art? So it's important to have that foundation at least clear to some extent, or else you run the risk of building on a kind of sandy ground, as it were. So that's just kind of the introduction here. It's like this school of phenomenology seems to have, I think, a lot of insights that are quite relevant to the practice of art. One, a couple of caveats I'm just going to throw out there. I am no artist and I'm not trying to pretend to be. Uh, I do have a PhD in philosophy and I have studied a lot of phenomenology, so I'm well versed in that. Um, but what I'm getting at here is that the visual arts, insofar as they are based on our conscious experience, have are very relevant to what is said in, philo in phenomenology. And insofar as, again, they are based on our conscious experience, then our, a clear articulation and presentation of what that conscious experience is like can lead to a richer understanding of that conscious experience and how, based on that conscious experience, we can make images, paintings, sculptures, et cetera, that properly reflect it and allow others to experience through means of our art, that original experience again, albeit in a new way. So that's what, the, that's, uh, that's what I'm aiming at without any pretension to be an artist or to uh, demonstrate particular artistic techniques or anything of that sort. I just want to show how a particular field of philosophy is, I think, quite relevant and helpful toward the practice of the visual arts. The second caveat, I guess, is that I'm using a very broad sense of art here. I'm not trying to uh, give any particular demonstration or discussion about Impressionism or Modernism, any kind of particular art. Um, I'm using it in a very broad sense. Um, my go-to examples might be often landscape paintings because they're the ones I'm most familiar with, but that's just my own preference as a use of an example to help uh, explain and articulate a certain point. So I'm not trying to privilege any kind of particular field here of art. I'm just trying to give a broad overview and sometimes the use of particular examples that will help flesh out these points that are sometimes a little bit abstract. Now, uh, so that's the second caveat. Um, I'm sure there's probably others, but I no, they're not coming to mind right now. So I think I'll, I'll kind of jump in. We get a better to just articulate what phenomenology might tell us about conscious experience and how that our understanding of conscious experience might actually be a benefit in the practice of making visual art. Okay, so let's start at the beginning, phenomenology. So phenomenology uh, is a school of philosophy that was begun by a guy named Edmund Husserl in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And a lot of very influential philosophers of the 20th centuries were either students of or influenced by Husserl. Uh, most prominent among these were Martin Heidegger, Albert, uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Mer uh, Maurice Marleau-Ponty, Simone de Beauvoir, Emmanuel Levinas, and more recently Jacques Derrida and Jean-Luc Mélenchon. A lot of uh, very, it's a very heavily, interestingly enough, very heavily French uh, field um, in the last 50 to 75 years, I would say. Okay, now, one of the helpful ways to get started though in understanding what we're getting at is to kind of break down this term.
So when we're talking about uh, the phenomenon of something, that's from the Greek meaning the appearance of something, right? So uh, we have other terms like phenomenal, it was a phenomenon, et cetera. The Greek phenomena is getting at the fact that certain things that, that we have, it's talking about how in our experience, a whole multitude of things appear to us in our conscious experience, right? So right now, you're not only looking at me through the means of this computer and through uh, the internet, but you're also looking at the board, what's in the background, cross, the wall. Uh, I think there's a umbrella up there. There's also, and then on me, you can look at the, the marker, my face, my sweater, et cetera, my hands, my beard. There's all sorts of things that are there in our conscious experience, okay? Things that appear. So again, the Greek phenomenon means appearance. Another way to, to talk about this is those things that are given in our conscious experience, that are part of our conscious experience, the things that are there in front of us as we have conscious experience of the world. Okay, it's, it's not meant to be too confusing. Hopefully it's fairly clear. It's just the way in which con we, things appear to us in our conscious experience, okay? And just to give a very, you know, some, some examples of this, we can have conscious experience, for example, of music, right? So I'm in my car, I'm driving along, and I turn the radio on. Now, there's nobody right there with me who's actually singing or playing an instrument, but by means of the radio, there is transmitted to me a piece of music, okay? And I hear it. So through, the, through my auditory faculty, what is given in my conscious experience is a piece of music, all right? Let's say it's a song by a particular band, say U2, I know I'm dating myself with that, but whatever. So uh, With or Without You by U2 comes on the radio and I hear it. And what we're getting at here is that the phenomenon of my experience, what is appearing to me through the radio, something that I'm sensing by means of my auditory faculty and through my ears is this song by the band U2. Now, um, we can think of another example when I'm going for a walk in the woods This and I start to smell something and it smells like Christmas. And I say, well, that's interesting. It's October, why does it smell like Christmas? Well, when I'm actually smelling, what's appearing to me by means of my sense, my, my, my nose and uh, is the smell of balsam fir trees, which smell a lot like Christmas, okay? So my experience at that point, mediated through the use of my nose and what I am actually smelling, is directed toward that balsam fir, okay? So the, 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 the smell of the pine of that coniferous tree is then given to me in my experience. That's what's appearing before me, just as the music was appearing before me, just as I'm appearing before you in your conscious experience right now. So phenomenon is a very broad term. It can cover things that we see, things that we touch, things that we hear, things that we smell, things that we taste, et cetera. It can cover things that, um, and we're gonna get into this a little bit more, it can cover things that we, that we experience directly, it can cover things that we experience indirectly, it can cover things that we have a memory of, it can cover things that we have an anticipation of, it can cover things that are, in our experience right now, but they're so ambiguous, we have difficulty understanding them. So it's a very, very broad term. It's just meant to talk about how in our conscious experience, there is a 
absolute plethora of things that are given in that experience, that appear to us in that experience in a variety of different ways. Now, hopefully that's pretty clear. The next term is phenomenology, right? That comes from logos, which is a Greek term. And logos can have a variety of different meanings, but mainly here right now is that logos means sort of the study of something, the in-depth discussion of something, saying the right words about something. So in other words, for the ancient Greeks, when I give the logos of something, I'm saying the right words about it. I'm giving the right presentation of it such that my interlocutor can have a better and clearer understanding of it. I'm making that thing more articulate for him by the means of my right words about the object in question. So we see this, of course, for example, in psychology the study of the human soul or the study of human personality, trying to say the right words about it. Biology, the study of life, bios, Greek for life, trying to create the, trying to say the right words about it. Theology, the study of God, theos being the Greek word for God. We're trying to say the right words, give the proper presentation, create, make a clear and articulate understanding of the object in question such that other people can come to a richer, deeper, and more meaningful sense about it. So phenomenology as a school or discipline is trying to say the right words about how we have conscious experience of phenomena. That's it. It's trying to give a clearer, more articulate presentation of the way in which things are given to us in our experience. It's trying to articulate what it's like for us to have conscious experience of the world and of ourselves. So phenomenon just meaning appearance, things that are given, et cetera, in our experience. Lology, logos, having to do with a way of explaining and saying the right words about those things that are given in our experience in the way in which that conscious experience takes place. Okay, so that being said, that's the primary meaning of phenomenology, all right? Um, and it's giving us a sense of the fact that insofar as we have conscious experience of all sorts of things in all sorts of different ways at all sorts of times with all sorts of other people and other sorts of beings, um, it's incumbent upon us to try to explain, articulate, clarify the ways in which that takes place. And that's the main kind of task here of phenomenology, saying the right words, the logos, about the things that are given to us in our experience and how that takes place. And you can, again, think of, think of some concrete examples, listening to the radio, smelling a tree that smells like Christmas, looking at somebody through a computer screen or in person. All of these are conscious experiences, okay? And insofar as they're conscious experiences, there's lots of things that can be said about them. And saying the right things about them is the task of phenomenology. That's the, the basic fundamental guiding aim of phenomenology. Uh, it does get into a lot of jargon and a lot of different ways of presenting things and a lot of different arguments and all of that. But what I just said is the guidance of the love. So that's the primary meaning of phenomenology. That's the one I'm gonna be sticking with for the most part. And that's the one that we're gonna really use. But there's a second kind of subtle meaning to it that I wanna just throw out and we're gonna get back to hopefully by the end of this. The second meaning is that 
you kind of is to flip around these terms a little bit to, to sort of manipulate them. Now this again, phenomena, the appearance uh, and the logos, meaning the saying the right words about the appearance of things and how they're given in conscious experience. Okay. But there's another thing we could say. The logos, I'll just write this out. Not only does logos mean the study of something, the saying the right words about it, the giving the proper presentation about it, uh, the mental comprehension of something. Okay, all of that seems to be what's happening with logos. There's also a way in which logos, in a kind of ultimate, final, and absolute sense for the ancient Greeks, it meant like the ultimate, final, and absolute principle of everything. All right. So logos was in that sense, that kind of more derivative, more abstract sense, was a term that talked about the ultimate mind governing everything, the ultimate intellect that was sort of the first principle of everything that existed. And it's very interesting because in the uh like in the gospel of saint john the uh when john is talking about christ he refers to christ as the logos right the the ultimate reality that governs everything the ultimate mind that orders all things in a certain way now what i'm getting at here is just that this term logos has this secondary more abstract meaning and however you want to understand that ultimate reality, that first principle of everything, that total governing mind, that basic structuring to the universe, however you want to understand that, that's what the term logos in Greek refers to in this secondary way. Okay, so then, therefore, when we're playing with this term, what we can see is that you put the emphasis on logos in this secondary sense, and you talk about the phenomenon, okay, of the logos. So here we're talking about the appearance of an ultimate principle, the way in which this ultimate mind, this absolute intellect, actually is given in appearance such that we can have some sense of it, some encounter with it, some experience of it, all right? Now, again, I'm just gonna put this obviously as the primary meaning, the study of saying the right words about appearances. But there's also a secondary meaning. And that is talking about an ultimate principle of the universe and the way in which that is given in appearance given an experience, the appearance of that thing, that manifestation or revelation, to use another term of that, that the, the transcendent being uh, presented in the imminent world of our experience and how does that occur? So that's this more secondary abstract sense. And I'm, I'm only pointing it out because I think toward the end, we're gonna get to see how a proper understanding of this, especially in terms of art, starts us thinking about this in terms of art. That, that once we've really mapped out the way in which things are given in experience, and we start getting into the depths of that, it's gonna start leading us toward thinking about maybe this is ultimately an appearance of the logos. Again, basically we're talking about the logos, the study of, the articulation of, the saying the right words about, the phenomenon, but, the fullest, the, the, the more in-depth we get with that discussion, it might lead us toward asking questions about the Logos, capital L, ultimate, and the way in which that's given an experience. Okay, so that's, that's just a basic sense of phenomenology. Now, in order to really get into this a little bit more, there's an important term that we can get to. And that is the term intentionality. 
intentionality. Okay, now it's very important that as we kind of begin this term and explaining it to separate it from the way we often think about intentionality, right? We have to think I have an intention to do something, meaning I have an aim to do it. I'm focused on doing it. I'm going to do it. And that's my plan. This is what I'm trying to accomplish here and now through means of these activities. All right. So I have an intention of trying to get a new job. I have an intention of trying to get a new car, of moving to a new place, getting a new spouse, whatever it is. Okay. People have all sorts of intentions. That is not very clear. I have to be very clear on this. That is not what intentionality means in phenomenology. All right, so phenomenology is going to take it in a much different direction, but it's important to have that clear from the beginning that we're going in a new way. So that being said, what does intentionality refer to? Basically, the principle of intentionality is that all conscious experience is conscious experience of something. Seems trivial, seems basic, but it's actually quite rich. All right. That means that when I am thinking, for example, I'm having, that's, when I'm having the conscious experience of thinking, I'm thinking about something. My mind is directed towards something. Okay. My mind is trying to grapple with something. My try, mind is trying to figure something out. My mind is trying to get a clear understanding of it. So when I'm having the conscious experience of thinking, what this means, according to the idea of intentionality, is that my thinking is directed towards something. It aims at something. Okay? So just as in the normal use of the term intentionality, it refers to how we aim at something with our wills, with our desire, with our plans. So the term intentionality in phenomenology refers to how with our minds, we are aiming at various things. So our minds, when they are thinking, are thinking about something. And our minds, when they are remembering, are remembering something, right? So I don't just have, for example, a memory I always have a memory of something or a memory about something. Another way to put this is that there's always that preposition that attends to the end of that activity. So I'm thinking about, I'm thinking of, um, I'm trying to figure out, I'm having a memory of, my thoughts are geared toward. That preposition always attaches to the end of the mental activity. So the mental activity is directed at, another preposition, some thing. Now, one way of describing this is that we always have an object of conscious experience. So my, con my, con my conscious experience is never just completely vague, undifferentiated, and non-directed. There's always something or set of some things toward which it tends, to which it's about which it's geared toward, which it attaches to, all right? So to go back to some of the earlier examples I gave, and they're just very basic, but I think helpful, just to think of yourself driving a car, all right? So there's all sorts of different kind of conscious experiences that you're having. Obviously, in driving a car, you're attending to the road. So your consciousness is, in one sense, geared toward and directed at the road that your car is on, um, that's a kind of main focus of what you're doing. But there are other foci that go on with our consciousnesses in these sorts of experiences, right? So the main focus is obviously on the road, but there's also a way in which we're kind of sensing, feeling the steering wheel. And we also have a sense of where our feet are and where we're sitting. Now that's again, again, I think it's very much secondary to the primary experience of the road. So primarily, and one in uh, one primary way our consciousness is directed is that it's directed toward the road, right? If I close my eyes when I'm driving, even if I still 
feel the steering wheel, even if I can still feel the pedals, I'm not able to drive. It's totally dangerous. And that's why falling asleep at the wheel is such a horrible thing because there has to be a very core way in which our consciousness is engaged with the road and what's near the road. All right. Um, as a matter of fact, I could put the cr car on cruise control and maybe even take my hands off the steering wheel if it's a straight road, say out in the desert in Arizona or New Mexico. Um, and I may be okay, but I always have to have my eyes open just in case something happens. So the eyes, the, the visual seeing is the kind of primary conscious experience that we're having when we're driving. It's necessary. It's totally foundational. But it's not the only one. That's what I'm getting at. Another one, like I said, is the sort of feeling of the steering wheel, feeling of the pedals. Um, but here's where it gets kind of fascinating. So, so I have the sort of more tactile experience of the steering wheel, and I'm kind of seeing it peripherally, but mainly I'm my visual experience is toward the road. So I have my consciousness directed primarily toward the road, secondarily toward the steering wheel and the pedals, but also my consciousness is directed toward uh, the music, for, for example, that's playing in uh, through the radio, right? I go back to that example. So I'll go back to the song. I hear With or Without You by U2 that comes on, and that song is, I'm, I'm hearing it. In other words, I'm having conscious experience of it. It's an auditory experience. I'm having the visual experience of the road, I'm having the tactile experience of the steering wheel and my feet and all of that. Um, I might even be smelling something at the same time while I'm driving. What we're seeing here is that there is a whole kind of constellation of conscious experiences that are happening amidst the activity of driving a car and listening to the radio, okay? So it's just indicating that conscious experience, like phenomenon is a very broad term covering a lot, a lot of different things and a lot of different modes, you know, be it auditory, visual, um, tactile, et cetera. Here's it where it gets even interest, more interesting, though, right? So not only can I be having this experience of the road, I'm seeing it, and the song, I'm hearing it, uh, and the rotting food I left underneath the seat, I'm smelling it. I can also, in the midst of all this, be thinking about phenomenology. I can have a thought about philosophy while driving, hearing the radio, and smelling rotting food. So our consciousness is multifaceted. It can go in very many different directions simultaneously. Again, in the activity of driving, there's a primacy granted necessarily to the visual seeing of the road and responding to it. If that's not there, you can't drop. Uh, there's also one, of course, given to the tactile feel and kind of peripheral seeing of the steering wheel and the speedometer and all of that. Uh, the tactile feel toward the uh, accelerator and the brake. But that doesn't exhaust the multifaceted and multidimensional modes of conscious experience that we're having. It's very, very broad. Okay, so Within this, what we can start to parse out, I think, are a couple of different things. One of the main ones, when we're really talking about intentionality, our consciousness is always consciousness of something, all right, is that we can talk about how the mind and the world are interactive. The mind is geared toward the world. The mind is engaged with the world outside of it. The mind is not self-enclosed. 
the mind is always interactive with the world. I'm seeing the road, right? I'm feeling the steering wheel. I'm hearing the song. I'm smelling the rotting food. Um, I'm thinking about Edmund Husserl and his thoughts on phenomenology. My mind is directed out into the world. It goes beyond itself and interacts with the world, all right? I'm not, when I'm looking out while I'm driving, I'm not seeing some fantasy. If I were, I should not be driving. When I'm feeling the steering wheel, I'm feeling a real steer steering wheel. If I think it's an imaginary steering wheel, again, I shouldn't be driving. When I feel the pedals, I'm feeling real pedals. If I think they're imaginary, I think should not be driving. So what this indicates to us is that the mind is not only directed to the world, but kind of involved in the world. The mind is experiencing things out there, if you will, things beyond it. The mind is interactive and caught up in. There's a bridge between the mind and the world. The mind is always geared toward the world, in other words, all right? Um, now, I'm just going to write this down because I think we can explain this a little bit more. Mind and world. One author who writes about phenomenology will describe it that mind and world are actually co-relative terms. All right. So just as le left and right are co-relative terms, right? Some, uh, if, if, uh, up and down are co-relative terms. North and south are co-relative terms. When you, th there, there are things that exist in reference to the other, right? Hot and cold, light and dark, okay? If something's light, it's not dark. If it's dark, it's not light. Um, in this case, when we're talking about mind and world as co-relative terms, what we're getting at is that to describe what the mind is and what the mind is like is to describe how we have conscious experience that has an intentionality toward the world. The mind is always directed toward the world. The mind is never, there's always a reference to the world in whatever our conscious experience is. So no matter what I'm doing, there's always some way in which I'm aiming at thinking about, remembering, uh, seeing, smelling something in the world, okay? What, to say just a little bit more about this, And I'm going to look at it through uh, discussions on kind of experiences of the past, the present, and the future, all right? Now, if I'm thinking about the past, I'm thinking about things that have actually happened in the world. So the memory faculty of my mind is directed as the intentionality, okay, toward the world toward things that actually happen. So for example, I think back to my uh, college graduate, uh, my dissertation defense, December, 2019. And I can picture the room and the, the, the six of us that were there and where I was sitting and how much water I was drinking because I was nervous and even what I wore and, you know, uh, kind of walking out after I had finished before I got the results and all those bundle of nerves I had. Um, and I can, I can still picture my professors. I can uh, get a sense of, I can, I remember what they said. I'm, my mind is going back to what actually happened, a, a, an event in the world, something that took place, all right? So that's what's going on in memory. Now, let's look at present experience. 
And we already have one. We have the experience of driving that I talked about. Again, very clearly in the present, in the now while I am driving, I, I have conscious experiences. My mind is directed toward various things out there in the world. The steering wheel, the pedals, the road, the music, the rotting food, all of that stuff is where my mind is going toward. It's, my mind is engaging with that. That's what my conscious experience is of the world out there. Um, and when I'm supposing or thinking about the future, when I'm anticipating something, for example, I'm anticipating the way that things will be in the world, right? So if I'm thinking about a talk that I'll be giving in a couple weeks out in St. Louis, I can imagine, I'm thinking about, well, what, what's that hotel going to be like? And who's going to be there? How many people will hear my talk? Do I need to use PowerPoint, et cetera? All of those thoughts are about an experience that's going to happen in the world. It's going to be there actually taking place. Okay. So what we see here, first of all, is that mind is a very broad term in phenomenology. Mind is meant to include all the vast array of conscious experiences that we can have, all right? So our minds are what enable conscious experience according to the school of phenomenology. Therefore, when we're having conscious experience through memory, through anticipation, through smelling rotting food, through smelling a balsam pine tree, et cetera, all of that is in some way an activity of our mind directed toward the world. Okay, so that's the first thing to note. The second thing to note is that the mind does is what it is and does what it does in relationship to the world. The mind is always geared toward the world. You know, just as like uh, being a parent means you're always geared toward caring for your child. You can't be a parent without a child. There always has to be that other who is the one whom you, you get or adopt, you care for, you look out for, you love, you have affection for, you're concerned about, etc. So there's always that other, in this case, the child, who's uh, there's always the being a parent is always in reference to a child for whom you're a parent. You're a parent of someone, or like you're a spouse of someone. You can't marry yourself. You have to marry somebody else. So that way you're the husband of a, a certain person or the wife of a certain person. Those are co-relative terms in the way I'm getting at. The similar way, the mind, which has conscious experience that is intentional, the mind in that way is, is what it is and does what it does toward the world. Just as a parent is who he is and does what he does in regard to a child, and a spouse is who she is and does what she does in regard to a husband, so too is the mind is what it is and does what it does in regard to the world. Intentionality. Okay. However, there's a second, another thing we have to talk about here in terms of mind and world. All right. We have to look at the fact that the world is what it is and does what it does in regard to mind. Now, this is where it's going to get kind of interesting. I think this is where we start really starting to see some of the ways in which this discussion can have relevance for art. Okay. Now, what is the, the world is often thought of as everything out there that's not me, right? The whole vast array of things throughout the entire universe. Everything that has ever existed exists now and will ever exist. Well, the, this, the grand sweep of things. Okay, in the final analysis, the world. That, that's what we often think about when we're talking about world. 
All right, fine. But this is this is this is very much key to hold this whole analysis. We would have nothing to talk about in terms of worlds if there had not been some conscious experience, if there had not been something that was given in conscious experience, something had not appeared, okay? If there hadn't been some way in which the mind interacted with something. All right, so for example, I can talk about the state of the world in the year 1500, right? I can talk about uh, what the discovery of North America was like, what the indigenous peoples were like at that time. I can talk about what the Chinese civilization was like. I can talk about the... Um, Renaissance and period in Europe, etc. So I can talk about the state of the world in the year 1500. Great. Now, in talking about the state of the world in the year 1500, it might seem as if I'm talking about something that's existed, uh, you know, over 500 years ago, and it's objectively true about it, and there's really nothing else to be said. However, let's dial back. In order for there to have been a history of the world, in order for there to have been things written about the world, in order for there to be a story or a narrative that has developed over time, there had to have been a lot of minds that experienced it, thought about it, wrote about it, discussed it, etc. Okay? To talk about the world in 1500 is to talk about something that has been consciously experienced in a whole host of ways by a huge number of minds. Okay? I'm not talking about something that was never experienced by anyone at any time. I'm rather talking about something that has been experienced by innumerable minds in innumerable ways in the last 500 years. To even think about world or talk about world, I have to make use of the mind. Okay, there's no way in which there can be a world unless there is a mind that experiences that world. All right. That is, we're talking about world. We're talking about the sort of thing that is the object of conscious experience, the sort of thing that we can study, we can have theories about we can write about, we can discuss, right? It's the sort of thing that we can give an ordered presentation of. So for example, about 10 minutes ago, five, 10 minutes ago, I talked about what the world was like in the early, uh, in the 1500s, and in the year 1500, all right? I'm talking about something. There's an object of my mental activity something I'm thinking about and trying to articulate. In that regard, okay, the world is that which our mind is always interactive with, okay? The world is that which our mind is always interact is interacting with. The world is not something out there that, no one has ever experienced or could experience, all right? The world is not completely divorced from the mind. The world is not something that exists totally on its own. No, when we're talking about the world in this way, what we're talking about is 
that which is available to our minds, that which our minds opens toward, okay? That which our minds is directed toward. So this is kind of turning things a little bit weird, all right? And there's no other way to get around it. And I'm sure if I were doing this lecture in person, there'd be all sorts of hands up, which would be great because that could give uh, definite questions that could give definite answers to, at least something with definite answers to. Not sure there are always definite answers in philosophy, but perhaps there are greater insights we can come to, which is very important. Um, the main point here, though, is that when we often think about worlds, just like we often think about the term intentionality, phenomenology kind of flips that on its head. It goes in a new way with it. It, 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 it talks about, like, just as I can't, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to have a couple, right, you're going to have two people who are in a committed relationship to one another, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever it is, all right? This is also a couple, the mind and the world, that are what they are and do what they do in reference to each other. So when I'm thinking about the world, it's really important for me to realize that, I'm, that the world in that way is something I'm mentally interacting with. It's not something cut off from my experience. It's not something that I can never proverbially touch or encounter in any way. It's there, it's there for my experience to occur in and toward. When we're talking about a relationship between two people and they're breaking up, if they're married, it's a divorce, right? It's a splinter. They're, they're torn asunder. They go, and, they go off and do their own thing. If there's a divorce between the mind and the world, what that means is that my, for example, my thoughts become kind of self-enclosed, right? Uh, this, this is very interesting to, too. We notice this, for example, with like mental illness when the mind is not working properly. Somebody keeps thinking, of, they're, they're, they're not able to actually get an accurate grasp of what's going on in the world. They're not able to interpret that correctly. They're not able to feel it in the right way. There's a disproportionate response to the way the world is when somebody is suffering from mental illness. So when you have um, a paranoid delusional situation, somebody is seeing things and feeling fear about things that are not actually in the world. So their mind is not, ac their mind is not accurately allowing them to interact with the world in the right way. There's a mental illness when there's a divorce between the mind and the world, just as there's a relational illness or relational problem when there's a separation or a divorce between the two people. When the two people start to split, the relationship is weakened or unhealthy. When the mind and the world start to split, the mind is unhealthy, weakened, or ill, a mental illness. Okay, now, what we're starting to see here, I think, is that Insofar as I experience the world, all right, I experience what is given to me in my consciousness. I can't experience the world except by means of my own consciousness. All right, there's no way I can ever experience the world except through that. I can't have a non-mental, non-conscious experience of the world. That's a contradiction in terms. I can't somehow like lift myself out of my consciousness and go into somebody else's consciousness and experience the world that way. If 
I'm interactive with the world, it's with my mind. If my world is interactive with me, it's through the mind, okay? So what this is telling us is that a sense of ourselves and the world where the world's over there and I'm over here is an inaccurate picture. It's an errant picture. It's actually probably, it's potentially indicative of mental illness like we just talked about. Go back to the example of driving the car. In driving the car, in a very basic and necessary way, I have to be seeing the world. My mind has to have that intentionality toward the road, the thing out there, okay? And if I'm going to have any sense of the road, say anything about it, have any thoughts toward it, if the road is ever going to be something that I experience in any way, I have to do it through my mind, through my consciousness. Again, we're using mind and consciousness um, co-equally here. They're, they're basically meaning the same thing, very broad sense of both mind and consciousness. Therefore, when we think about world, we have to think about that which I consciously experience. There's no other way in which to get to the world except as that which I consciously experience. See, we're often, I think, tempted to think of world as the way things are regardless of my experience. The objective way things are irrespective of anybody's experience of it. But if there were no experience, there would be nothing to say it's an objective truth. There'd be nothing to say it's out there, okay? If there were no experience, we would have no data to analyze, to write about, to think about in any way. If there were no experience, we wouldn't have any kind of data that we could say about it. It's an objective truth. So for example, we're tempted to think it's an objective truth that right now I'm holding a marker in my right in my left hand. I don't know my left from my right, I guess, but it's an objective truth that I'm holding a marker in my left hand. Fine. But that statement can only take place because of a more primary and fundamental experience of the world. If there were no conscious experience, and if there were no things that we were experiencing, no data, no, no, no appearances, as it were, then we would have nothing to say about anything at all, including the objective truth or objective status of anything out there. Now, what this further means is that when I'm thinking about my conscious experience, I can't be thinking about the way the world is out there and then think that's what my conscious experience is. Because what I've done is to try to isolate world away from mind, which is an errant and incorrect move. It's like that splitting of the relationship, okay? So when I'm thinking about my conscious, when I'm trying to articulate my conscious experience, I should not use as a standard some kind of like scientific analysis of what the world is. I shouldn't use as a standard some sense of what other people have said about the world. I shouldn't use as a standard some textbook set of definitions. I shouldn't use as a standard some kind of 
presentation of quote unquote objective facts about the world and then say, well, that's what my experience is. No, again, all I'm trying to do there is isolate the world in itself, but that's not how I experience the world. My experience is of the world in my own consciousness, full stop, okay? That's it. And my consciousness as such is always directed to the world. And the world, as I experience, is always directed toward my consciousness. All right? I'm involved in a mind-world relationship constantly. And that is not only the starting point, but it's the totality of my experience. So there's nothing else I can do. I cannot step away from this interrelationship, all right? I am embedded in it. I can't do without this. This is absolutely necessary. So just, just to keep going with this for a sense, we can often think, okay, so, if I'm gonna to try to articulate what it's like for me to have intentionality or what it's like for certain things to be given in my experience, um, I always wanna make sure that I have some objective, factual sense of the world that I can use in order to properly guide and regulate that articulation of my conscious experience. I'm gonna use this as a standard, I'm gonna use it as a measuring stick, I'm gonna use it as a guidepost, et cetera, whatever analogy you wanna use. Okay, fine, we often do this, but it's wrong, right? Because what we're trying to do, it's wrong for a couple of reasons. One, it's wrong because that's not how we actually experience the world. And B, it's wrong because we're not actually trusting our own experience, okay? So when we're trying to talk about the way things are given to us, we have to, start with, make use of, and end with that, the way things are given to us. And that implies, of course, a trust, but I think phenomenology is like super important here. Why? Because phenomenology says the mind is what it is and does what it does directed toward the world. So we don't ever have to, and phenomenology also implies that the more the mind moves away from the world, the more it's kind of in an illness, something is going wrong. So phenomenology gives us this picture of saying, look, this is what the mind is. You can trust it, okay? Um, you know, like if I have been given a self-driving car, for example, and that self-driving car has been programmed to get me to my job, my place of work, and I, I get in and I'm a little hesitant. I don't know, man, I'm kind of worried about this. And the guy's like, no, trust me, trust this, it's okay. That car has been programmed to get you from here to your job. Just go with it, all right? Or if I get on a train and, uh, you know, the Metro, I used to live in Washington, DC, and I get on the Metro in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I'm on the red line and I want to get to Catholic University of America where I did my grad studies at. I just have to get on, okay? It's just gonna go there, just trust it. The same way phenomenology is saying, trust the mind, okay? The mind is structured toward the world. It's geared toward the world, all right? So if you wanna get a sense of what conscious experience is like, if you wanna articulate conscious experience, if you wanna kind of use it as a basis for art, Kind of getting to that, as I told you, you would, you would, you can trust that the mind is geared toward the world. But that trust also implies that you're not second guessing it, not saying, I don't know if I'm actually experiencing this. It's like, no, no, you are experiencing it. You, <laughs> there's nothing else that could be happening. You can't be seeing the world and not seeing the world at the same time. That's a contradiction in terms, or in philosophy, we call it a violation of the principle of non-contradiction, which is absolutely fundamental to any kind of coherent thought whatsoever. So the mind in the world as co-relative means you can trust them. You know, this is kind of a weird example, but I think it's gonna work. 
a child who sees the strength of his parents' relationship eventually grows to trust that because he sees they're geared toward each other. They're looking out for each other. They care about each other. They love each other. They have that unity and that uh, connectivity in that profound way. And the child can trust them. And in a kind of analogous sense, I would say we're sort of like that kid having to learn to trust that this mind of ours is co-relative to the world and the world is co-relative to the mind. That we're walking around in our, that we're, that we're carrying out our experiences and, and, and enacting our experiences and living our lives in that way. And in this manner, what we're recognizing is that my mind is interactive with the world and the world is given to being given to me in my conscious experience. I'm not having imaginations. I'm not having hallucinations. Um, I'm not having fantasies. I'm involved in the world and the world is being given to me. So it's about that fundamental trust. And when we have that fundamental trust, you know, to go back to this analogy with the kid, right? Eventually the kid recognizes that his parents in their relationship to each other have a solid, loving, caring, committed relationship. And he learns to trust them. He also learns not to compare it to anybody else's relationship or what a textbook says about relationships or what he's seen on TV about relationships or what he's heard about in a song or read about in a book. He ceases to use those as paradigms by which to measure the success or failure, strength or weakness of his parents' relationship. Those, he can bracket that off, set it aside, not really worry about it. Why? Because he's learned to have a very strong and implicit trust in that connectivity and loving relationship between his parents. And I think in the same way, phenomenology, as we've started to outline it here, gives us that kind of implicit trust in the connection and relationship between our own minds and the world. It allows us to say, I don't need to go to the textbook for the standard of what it's like. I don't need to rely on objective facts. I can trust that this relationship is working well and I can therefore articulate and talk about and describe what has been given to me in my experience as the mind and world are interacting, as my mind is interactive with the world and the world is interactive with my mind. Just as I can trust that the train is gonna to get to um, Catholic University of America campus when I get on it, the red line Silver Spring, because that's its, its aim or intentionality, I can likewise trust that the mind is geared toward the world because that's its aim or intentionality. That is what it is and does what it does. Full stop, there's really not much else. So it, it kind of can alleviate those fears and then build up that trust. And we often think that the mind is best used when kind of engaged in abstract processes, right? When learning more, uh, when learning certain formula, when learning, learning certain facts about reality, for example. So here a paradigm would again be something like a scientist or a theorist who's coming up with some explanations about the way things are. And we think of that as paradigmatic or um, a really wonderful use of the mind. We try to think if I'm going to properly use my mind, it's going to have to accord with that somewhat. It has to, has to be like that in some way. It has to make use of the insights that that person came to. It has to really follow what that person's method is. That's the standard, the gold standard. And I'm going to have to do something similar or in some way along those same lines if I'm going to get to that same place. I, I, I have to kind of try to be like that in some way or make use of what he's told me. Understand his facts. Be cold. Be objective. Be disinterested. Uh, just say just the facts, man, as they said in uh, Dragnet. Right. Well, here's an interesting thing. Right.
that analysis, that theorizing, that writing down of certain propositions and articulation of facts is actually derivative, okay? Uh, Heidegger, to go back to, to him for a second, we're talking about it as something that is founded upon our primary conscious experience, okay? It's, it's an abstraction away from our conscious, our primary conscious experience. So to use just, just one example, it's, it's one we're all familiar with, right? Isaac Newton sitting in his family, you know, as the story goes, he's sitting in his family's orchard, and what does he see? He sees an apple fall to the ground. That's his primary experience. He didn't imagine it. He didn't have a fantasy and say, oh, what is it? no, he sees an apple falling to the ground. Based on that experience, he starts thinking, how is it the case that the apple falls downward? Why? He starts asking the interesting question. Why does the apple not go upward or to the side? Why do apples always go downward? What is it about the earth that acts like a magnet to compel objects such as apples to fall downward with that sort of force toward the earth? This of course what leads him to eventually talk about and articulate the law of gravity. But let's, let's, let's analyze this for a second. Newton was not experiencing gravity as such. Newton was, was seeing primarily, this is what he was doing, this story hold, is true, Newton was seeing an apple fall from a tree. And based on that, he was starting to ask questions. So if Newton had been asked, hey, draw a picture of your experience, he would draw a picture of an apple falling from a tree. He wouldn't draw gravity. That doesn't, that's, in, that's nonsensical. You can't draw something like gravity. Now, what we're seeing here, I think, is that the basic way of experiencing the world is always direct, immediate, experience of our consciousness in the world, seeing it, feeling it, smelling it, hearing it, etc. Right here, right now, what's being given to me in my experience? Well, let's go back to that scientist I talked about earlier. We often think, okay, that's the guy that's got the most clear, accurate, proper understanding of the world, right? He knows the facts about the world. Well, let's just look at facts for a second, that term. It's a, you know, we've had some very, how do you say, interesting things said about facts over the last four or five years. But what phenomenology tells us is something very insightful, I think helpful about facts. And put, put quite bluntly, what phenomenology tells us is that in a primary and immediate way, we do not experience facts. We experience the world. A fact is an articulation of a kind of uh, presentation of our experience of the world. So I don't experience the fact that I'm holding this marker in my hand. No, I hold the marker in my hand. I don't experience the fact that I'm, hold, that I'm seeing the marker. No, I see the marker. That's my consciousness. That's my primary conscious experience. Okay, a fact, facts come in when we, when we try to give a pre proper presentation of when we try to articulate what that experience is actually like. Um, and when we try to articulate both to ourselves and to other people, or when a group of people try to do this together. So for example, to go back to drag, right? There's these two police officers and they wanna know what happened. 
And the person being interviewed can sometimes weave a story about things. And they just want certain, they, they just want to know about certain particular things that happen. And those certain particular things that happened are like, what time was it? Where was it? Who was there? Sort of weapon did the person have, et cetera. So they're trying to get at the facts. But let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So the witness that's being interviewed by the police, in her experience, first and foremost, she saw something or witnessed it. And she is a witness. And what did she witness? She witnessed perhaps a guy in a ski mask robbing a bank and taking and getting in a car that had a green car and she couldn't read the right license plate. That's what she experienced, okay? Now, a day later, she's trying to remember it. And as she remembers it, she recognizes, she, she not only remembers it, but she tells what she remembers to the police officers. And the police officers just want to know about time, date, where, height of the guy, weight of the guy, etc. So they're trying to take that experience, refine it, and pinpoint certain things that then they can call facts. Okay. Now here, what we net recognize is that facts are, of course based in reality. They're an articulation of the way we've experienced the world, all right? And if, a, if there's 10 of us all seeing an ocean, okay, then later on, and there's a boat coming across the ocean, we can say, oh yes, there was that boat. That was a fact. So when we're talking about our experience, giving a presentation of our experience, giving a description of our experience, we talk about facts. And those facts are a way of presenting or discussing what actually took place. But they're not what we primarily experience. All right, just as it's a fact that the apple fell to the earth with the force it did because of the pull of gravity, but Isaac Newton did not experience gravity as a fact. He experienced an apple. And from that, he was able to extrapolate toward the laws that governed why the, the apple fell the way it did. All right. In the same way, when we're describing, discussing, articulating, presenting our experience, et cetera, when we're removed from it and trying to explain it, all right, we can talk about facts. So Newton could talk about the fact of gravity as something that accurately described and explained why the apple fell like it did. And the two police detectives on the show Dragnet can describe that certain things are of central importance to their investigation, and those certain things are what they call facts. But they're not ever actually experiencing, no one ever actually directly experiences facts. Facts are a way of talking about things that have occurred. There are a way of getting a sense of things that have occurred, right? If you're trying to say, or trying to explain why did this happen, you say, well, what are the basic facts? And that is you take what you remember and you um, localize it. You look at it in a particular way, try to describe that memory, that remembered scene in a certain way such that you can 
get an explanation of why things happened the way they did, just as we saw with Isaac Newton. Now, I'm not trying to say that facts are completely subjective. Obviously, they're not because if you have an accurate memory of something, you can use that memory to then talk about the facts of it. Um, if you have, and if there are a group of people who have the same memory, they can describe the facts of it. But fact arises when you have a description of something, you're giving an explanation of it. We don't directly, immediately in our lived experience actually consciously experience facts. Why is that important for this? Well. It's important because if somebody is asking you to present or make an image of what you're experiencing, all they're asking about is, how is it the case that the world is being given to your mind right now? What's actually appearing to you right now? What are you seeing? right now not the fact about it, but what are you seeing all right now this can get let me get a little bit more clear right um if i were to draw the sun as it's given in my experience of it okay i would not draw the sun according to its factual proportions because the sun is larger factually speaking than the earth or if I were to draw the moon, I would not draw it according to its factual proportions because the moon, factually speaking, would take up a large portion of the earth. It would be impossible. So the way in which we're talking here is to describe how things are given to our experience, to trust that and to recognize that that's not the same as talking about them objectively or factually. It's not because we think the facts are not true or that there are alternative facts or anything like that. We're not going down that road at all. What we're actually describing is, the, is that in our experience, the world is given a certain way. And when we try to represent that or represent it or make an image of it, it has to be true to that conscious experience without asking, is it factual? Is it objective? Does it hold up to this standard or anything like that? All right. So, for example, uh, without getting, let's let's not even get into the visual arts quite quite yet. If somebody were to ask, give a um, presentate, ask me to give a presentation with words, you know, not not drawing anything, not making a sculpture, but give a presentation with words about a certain experience. And if I said, you know, I saw uh, a the man, he looked like X, Y, and Z, okay? That's true. That's how he was appearing to me. He looked like, that's how he was given in my experience. He had brown hair, six feet tall, burly guy, seemed, seemed angry, wearing a blue jeans and a green jacket, okay? That's what I experienced. Now, maybe it turns out that the guy was actually uh, had was hunched over. So he's more like six, factually, he's more like six two. And let's just say that it wasn't green, it was more navy blue, all right? His jacket. Now, does that mean that my experience was so errant as to not trust it. No, okay? I saw the guy a certain way. That's how he was given in my conscious experience. And that's all I can go on. Now, that's to start, all right? So the, the, the thing is, is that if I'm just focused on articulating and making a... Um, a linguistic presentation, saying, talking about what I experienced. I have to go with that, with what I experienced. I did not experience him as six feet tall. Now, if somebody comes up later and says, well, you may have, he may actually be six feet tall, 
it's probably wise for me to think, okay, uh, and he was bent over, and then they show a, a picture of him, or I meet the guy in person, it's wise for me to say, okay, I guess that kind of helps me to, to uh, get a better sense, a more accurate sense of him. But it doesn't cause me to totally undermine and disvalue my original experience and not trust it. Go back to that term trust that we've been using. All right. I can only start with and give a description of that which I experience, the way in which my mind is interacted with the world. I, I think we're, we're kind of under this burden of trying to achieve absolute objectivity. But absolute objectivity is when you're just thinking about the world in isolation. So it's an, it's an abstraction, right? Because the mind and the world are interactive constantly with each other, as we've been saying, all right? So even to go back to Newton or a scientist like that, they're abstracting from their experience and then trying to give theories and explanations about it. And once they've given those theories and explanations about it, then they say, oh, this is the way the world is. And, you know, gravity is part of that proper explanation of the world considered under a scientific lens, right? To explain the physical properties of the world and how things interact in that way requires making use of gravity, right? But then the question is, I don't really experience gravity in my everyday world right? I don't experience gravity in a direct, immediate way. I don't experience gravity as such. I don't think about it. It doesn't talk to me. I don't see it. I don't hear it, etc. Yeah, things fall, right? So I try to catch a falling pen. That's what I'm, I'm seeing and trying to move myself toward a falling pen. That's my primary experience. Now, if I want to scientifically analyze it, I could say, yeah, okay, gravity was part of but that's not what I'm basically doing in my world. So what I'm saying is that the more we're trying to get an objective sense of things, quote unquote, the more we're just trying to think about the world from a kind of abstract scientific perspective. We're trying to think about it through the lens of a theory or set of theories, for example. So, like, another example would be evolutionary theory says that, objectively speaking, it's the case that people mate because they want to pass on their genes, okay? But in our lived experience, no one is ever going to go up to a potential date or spouse and say, I really want to marry you and procreate with you so that I can pass on my genes. Because that's not how we live. Um, or another, we can talk about being at the ocean, right? When we see the tides. And what causes the tides? The pull of gravity from the moon on the oceans. Okay, but that's not how we experience the tides. We might experience it as a flow as a calming energy. We might experience it as some sort of beautiful rhythm that we attune to. Or just watching the waves in and out. That's what we're primarily experiencing. So it's not as if in our experience, we always have to think about how does our experience accord with some scientific theory or some objective set of facts about the world. We don't have to subject our experience to that kind of tribunal of examination, in those words. We can trust it, all right? You know, again, I keep going back to this example, but that kid learning to trust the commitment of his parents recognizes, I don't have to compare their loving relationship to the psychology textbook that I'm reading, right? I know deeply, personally, and intimately that they have a good, healthy relationship. I can trust them. And I can even describe it according to the terms of that relationship, according to what actually takes place, right? So like good novels, for example, are always about, good works of literature are always about a particular way that somebody experiences the world. 
Now, the fascinating thing is then it tells us something in general, but it's also particular. So there's this sort of dance between particularity and generality that's actually going on. But the good novel is not just trying to take like scientific facts and then give ex, uh, examples of them in a novel. That's a horrible piece of literature. It's not trying to impose a theory and then say, well, this is how the theory would play out. You know, that, 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 that doesn't work when you're trying to force all of that together. Rather, what it's doing is giving a description and articulation of the way that people live in this story, such that it tells us about them, but also about ourselves. So the art of good storytelling in that way is to involve us in a particular world or a particular relationship particular way of life of somebody that then allows us to recognize certain patterns, truths, et cetera, that pertain not only to the characters and the story directly, but also to ourselves. So we see a particularity and a generality being played out together in that way. Now, what this, I think, is starting to show us in terms of art is that when we are thinking about the way in which we have conscious experience, we can trust this mind-world relationship that we have. We can trust our intentionality. We can trust that, the that, that we are being given actual phenomenon from the world. And we can also recognize that there's something to be said about our own way of being in the world and relating to it. Something that is useful, insightful, interesting, something important that has that about how we see the world that we can present so that others get a sense about it. Right? Like a good, a good author, again, is going to have a particular way of experiencing the world. And based on that, he's going to write. And that's going to give us a sense of him, but also ourselves. So I think the visual arts are, are very much the same in that regard, right? That what we're trying to do here is get a way of presenting, making an image of what we've actually experienced in the way that we've experienced it. Not according to some objective standard, not according to some set of facts, not according to some scientific theory, but the way that we have experienced it, the way the world has been given to us in our experience, trusting in the validity of that experience and also trusting like the author that that experience will not only articulate the way the world is given to us, but also will tell other people something important about themselves and their experience of the world, just as a good work of literature articulates a particularity and a generality. So that's that's where we get this, this sense of like using art, be it literature, and most especially in this case, the visual arts, painting, sculpture, et cetera, as a way of presenting what I have experienced on a canvas, for example, so that it makes present again in a new way, what I've originally experienced. Okay, so let me just say a few more words about this. You know, if I see a landscape, I'm gonna use this as, a, as my example, um, just as an example, um, and it's, that experience is given in a certain way. There's a, there's a certain things that stand out in it. Say the, the, the right now it's fall. So there's, cer there's certain colors that really stand out. Or there's certain parts of the of the mountains in the background that are really prominent, or the way that the the, the leaves are against the the backdrop of the mountains behind them, something or or even sort of the congruence of the whole thing, the way it seems to tie and fit well together, something about that experience is quite moving to me and memorable, and I trust that it has granted me an insight into something really beautiful, really inspiring. Then I wanna, then I feel inspired and motivated to, to, to draw it. And I don't have to worry while I'm doing so 
that I'm just seeing an image or it's my own subjective interpretation. No, what I'm making present by means of the art is that experience as it was originally given to me, right? I'm making an image of that landscape as I originally experienced it. I'm making a drawing of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm making a representation of that original experience in the beauty, uh, coherence, color, et cetera, that it had when I originally experienced it. Now, obviously there's a difference, right? The, the original experience is um, me seeing it, is me seeing it. And now my presentation is of that landscape. I'm making a presentation of the landscape. I'm making an image of the landscape. I'm making a drawing of the landscape. It's not the same as the landscape, but I'm making a drawing of the landscape as it was given to me in my experience. I'm not trying to draw the landscape as it might be out in the world in an objective scientific way. I'm not trying to draw the landscape the way I think it is. I'm trying to draw the landscape as it was given for me in my experience, all right? The good author is not talking about the way that people are, he thinks people are. He's talking about the way people have been in his life, all right? The good artist is not talking about, it's not drawing the way thinks the world is out there he's talking he's drawing the way the world has been given to him in his experience which he can trust and which he trusts will be such as to allow others to have a similar sort of insight so again we we we, we see that we don't we're not talking about the landscape out there we're talking about the landscape that has appeared in my experience, the phenomenon of the landscape as my mind is intentional toward it and that mind world connection, all right? What has been given to me in my experience? This landscape, how has it been given in terms of the colors, in terms of it fitting together, in terms of the way things relate to each other, um, in terms, etc. Those are the questions. The question is not so much like, wait, what is a landscape? What are the features of a landscape in general? No, trusting the particularity of the experience and from that particularity, making a, an image of it, a drawing of it, a presentation of it, which allows somebody else to delve into it, albeit immediately through the art, in such a way that they might have some kind of experience similar to or resonant with the original experience that motivated you to have to make the drawing in the first place. Okay, as I say that, what we're starting to see is the fact that there is a depth to this experience, right? There's a depth to the way in which something is given in my conscious experience of it that moves me to write about it, to draw it, etc. You know, if, if something doesn't grab me, if I just interact with it all the time and there, I never have any particular focus on it, there's nothing about it that speaks to me in the depth of my soul or really moves my heart, then I, I'm not really motivated to draw. So often, I don't think this is always the case, but often I think, or at least sometimes I would say, Withdrawing, what happens is that something in its depth has kind of moved us, we could say spoken to us in the depth of who we are. And that has got us motivated toward making a image of it, toward drawing, toward making a sculpture of it, et cetera. Something about this thing in the world, in the way that I've experienced it, has spoken to my heart, has spoken to my soul and got me geared toward making a representation of it, to honor it in that way. So I think what we're, we're starting to see is that the, the representation has a motivation rooted in some sort of 
inspiration or some sort of experience of depth. And this is where I'm going to start going back to what I had said before. Primarily, we've been talking about phenomenology as the right words about the given of experience. And then now we talked about the intentionality and how the mind and world are correlative. We spent a lot of time on that. But now as, we're, as you see this, this ability to kind of trust the way the world is given my experience, I also can start to trust the depth of that experience. And in that way, I might start to wonder what, for example, is the root of the beauty that I'm encountering here and now, right? Is this beauty of this landscape a manifestation of some sort of ultimate beauty? Why is it the way that it is? What made it the way that it is? Is there something transcendent, some sort of quality beyond space and time that's actually being played out here and now in my experience? So now, I, you know, this is not, this is a, like the, the depths of something speaking to my soul, as I noted earlier, indicate we're not just talking about like seeing a marker and talking about a marker or seeing a, a, a car or, or hearing a song on the radio. Something else is at work. And it's often hard to articulate. I'm not going to really try to spend too much time on that. But I think we can all recognize these sorts of experiences where like there's more going on. There's something else at play. I'm sensing some other dimension of some, something else is here. I have a sense of that this is truly beautiful. This is not just me interpreting this as beautiful. This is strikingly beautiful. This stands out. There's some other reality at play that I can't really see. I can't, I, I, I can't really articulate. I don't really yet have words for necessarily, but something else is happening. You know, another example that people talk about is like seeing a, their newborn children and they recognize there is a depth and a beauty and a value here that they can't put into words, but that they feel utterly, profoundly, and quite meaningfully. And it sort of motivates them for the rest of their lives in being a parent. Now, what I think this begins to tell us is that in our conscious experience of the world in this intentionality toward the world it's not just toward things in a kind of banal uh, basic level sense it's also towards like i said the depth of things where, where you don't just a parent doesn't see a newborn child as flesh and bones and uh all of that they see a new infinitely precious infinitely valuable human being who belong who is theirs so that there's a whole different level that you get to when you see in that way. So that, that seeing in that way is uh, what uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand, who's another phenomenologist, but he would talk about how we're, we're, we're kind of like getting an intuition of beauty, for example. Um, or another, here's another example. Sometimes you, somebody is such a good person that their goodness is manifest in our experience of them. We don't just see them as a person, we see them as a good person, that's direct. You immediately know, feel, and encounter them. It's, it's part and parcel of our relating to that person in a very uh, profound way. We, don't, we, we are struck by the goodness of the person. The person stands out as good in our experience of him. Um, you know, or as a hopeful person, immediately upon meeting this person, we ourselves feel a, a renewed hopefulness because of the hopefulness that is constitutive of who and what this other person is. So we're not just experiencing the person in terms of some like flesh and bones and skin and all that. We're experiencing all this other dimension and depth to the person as it is given in our experience. That is again, opening us up to the possibility at least, or the questions about the fact that what we may ultimately be experiencing is something like the appearing of the logos. Um, there was a Eastern Orthodox thinker, Maximus the Confessor, who talked about how every branch, every twig and every leaf are themselves what he would call logoi of the logos. They are particular, 
words, if you will, that express the ultimate world, particular manifestations of the ultimate. There are particular ways of it being revealed and made present so that we can experience it. So I think what we're seeing is that that depth, be it a beauty, of goodness, of meaning, et cetera, that's opened up to us in these experiences, okay, of the beautiful landscape of the child, et cetera, beckon toward the possibility that there might be a higher or deeper dimension at work that is being manifested in our experience. All right, one, one classical philosophy way of describing it is the transcendent being revealed in the imminent. All right. Something else is at work beyond what we normally understand, normally conceive of, what we normally think about the world that generates in us a sense of the depth of it, the, the meaning of it, the, 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 the ultimate beauty of it. And in that way, what we might be seeing here is that this is a phenomenon or an appearance or a manifestation of an ultimate reality, an ultimate meaning, an ultimate goodness, or an ultimate beauty. This also connects us to what I talked about earlier. See, I talked about earlier about how a good author leads you into the story of two per people or five people, whomever it is, but their particular story. He's not trying to say, okay, these are basic psychological facts, and now I'm going to write a story that, that exemplifies these facts. That's a horrible way to write. Rather, he, he delves into that story and we're moved into that particular way of life and the particular narrative, the particular events and experiences that these people are having. So it seems like we're just, as I said, getting into that particularity. But this is where I think it's very fascinating. I think getting into that particularity also allows us to see ourselves in there. So some sort of more universal or general truth or way things are, has been articulated by means of this delving into and presenting a particular story. I kind of have a hunch that what's going on here is that as we get into that particularity, we see something of a manifestation of the universal logos. You know, just to go back to Maximus the Confessor, right? He said, look, Every branch, every tree, every leaf manifests the ultimate logos, is a logoi of the logos, is a word of the ultimate word, all right? However, that's moreover, I should say, as we see things as a phenomenon of the logos, okay, it bring, they, they point back to it. They're a revelation. They reveal something about ultimate reality. All right. So as, as something is revealed about ultimate reality, it becomes clearer, it becomes more noticeable. And therefore, we can see its other kind of manifestations in other ways and in other instances and in other experiences. All right. In other words, what I'm getting at is that the particularity of a good art brings us to a sense of the revelation of the logos, the phenomenon of the logos, that phenomenology. And in so doing, what it does is grants us a sense of an ultimate truth, an insight into an ultimate reality. And therefore it is generalized or universalized. You know, again, I spoke about how the particularity of a story paradoxically actually generates a generality. Okay, it allows us to see some general truth. And I think what it does, I think the reason it does that is that it allows us a focused, refined understanding of the particular revelation of ultimate reality. And therefore we get a clear, more insightful, we get a clear insight into that logos. But that logos is ultimate. So it's generally and universally true and applicable. And therefore the particular allows us to see the general and of course vice versa. So I think the same is going to hold for art. That's why, again, that, that trust, you know, the twofold level of trust we've been talking about, trusting the mind world experience and the connected connectivity and relationship between the two, but also trusting that my particular experience, even though it's mine, 
is still possibly a way of viewing a manifestation or phenomenon of the logos. And insofar as I can properly and reverently represent that or make an image of that, it might allow others by means of it to have a, some insight into that logos and therefore have a, a more general revelation of truth or goodness or beauty. The, the, the particular and the general are not at odds here. They actually are, are meant to work together. The universal and the singular are meant to work together. In philosophy, we call this the one and the many, okay? So that the one painting or the one landscape that is viewed by many can actually point back to a one reality that is the ultimate beauty, if you will, or ultimate goodness that we see dispersed in many ways. The particular can point to a general universal reality that allows us to have a deeper insight into it. So that, that, that trust can be, okay, this is the way things are given my experience. There's a depth to this experience. That depth might point to the fact that what I'm actually encountering here is perhaps a manifestation of some ultimate logos. However I conceive of that, beauty, goodness, mind, whatever. And that my ability to properly image that, to make a drawing of it, to make a sculpture of it, allows for my view, the viewers of it to likewise have an insight into this ultimate universal reality, this ultimate logos. Now, this is why I think it's important to, to recognize that like uh, there's an, a way in which uh, art perhaps is like an icon. You know, art's a way of manifest, making present what is in some senses invisible, right? So an, an icon in Eastern Orthodoxy is, is, is a painting that has been done as a way of inciting prayer, as a way of inciting a relationship to God. And I think art in general, though, has something like that at work, some sort of iconic function. Because I think it's not that just art is making a presentation about particular experiences that we've had on the surface level, full stop. It's about bringing the depth of that experience to presence, to experience again, by means of the painting, the sculpture, et cetera. So the painting images and represents that original landscape, that original sky, that original face. And it does so in such a way that the, the depth of the person, the landscape, the sky, are likewise manifest again, are revealed again. But those depths are, as we said, perhaps phenomenon of a logos. So they are pointing back toward or referring back to an ultimate reality. So there's, there's some sort of possibility, at least, of a more iconic or sacred dimension at work here, however you want to conceive of that. Okay, so I think uh, it's probably good to wrap up. Um, what we've seen is that a saying the right words about the way things are given in, a, in, in our uh, experience, the, um, the appearance of things in our experience, saying the right words about them, allows us to understand that the mind is always directed toward the world that has that intentionality. What it further allows us to see is that the mind and world are co-relative, they're interconnected, they have that, that deep relationship. This allows us to trust in our experience as things are given to us and to avoid thinking that we need to describe, present, make art about facts, science, the way things actually are, etc. But rather we can trust in our own experience as it has happened and make a representation of the things that have been given that experience. 
We can further trust that that representation, that image, <clears throat> that painting, that statue, that sculpture, et cetera, of that original experience, of what is given in that original experience, might actually lead back toward a general universal reality of beauty, of truth, of goodness, et cetera. So that delving into the particularities of our experience and what we have experienced allows for the possibility of some greater truth to be manifested by means of our art. So I think phenomenology opens up a very fascinating picture into what our minds are like relative to the world, how we can trust that correlativity, that connection, that relationship between mind and world, and how that trust allows for a deeper encounter with reality and its depth and the, the way of presenting and making art that manifests those depths and ultimately pointing back perhaps to an ultimate logos. Thank you very much. And that's it. Oh, yes, I do.